Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, so good to see you. I want to welcome those who are watching uh, at home as well. And uh, you can take out your teaching outlines as we're beginning a brand new series. And those watching at home can follow along right on the Crossroads Church app. Uh, we've titled this series Reveal, and we're going to be going through the book of Revelation, at least the first couple of chapters over the next couple of weeks together. And uh, part of the reason is, is because um, it's, uh, it's fitting that we go through and journey through all books of the Bible, but especially the book of Revelation, because there's something unique there for us to learn and to follow. Um, and it's this, you'll see it right there on the top of your notes. Revelation, it without question reveals a unique hope concerning God's provisions, his promises, and that which uh, pertains to prophecy for you and I. And I believe that we're living in a time more than ever before when we need to zero in and focus upon hope. I, I think you would agree with that uh, based on all that's going on. Uh, but even if you're on top of the mountain right now, spiritually, financially, socially, or you, know, you just feel great, it, still, uh, life has a way of sneaking up on us, the things of life that we don't prepare for. And it's very easy for us to lose hope in this life. Wouldn't you agree with that? That there are things that could cause us to lose hope, no matter how spiritual we might think we might be or how much we might have it together. In fact, uh, right here on the top of your notes, I listed here um, really the 30, the 30 dozen, uh, you know, basically 12 things that could cause us to potentially lose hope. And I want to draw your attention to it. And you might see yourself in one of these or maybe a few of these um, that are a part of life. And maybe we'll just look at the top because Today, we're going to be talking about hope through the book of Revelation, uh, but before we dive into that, we want to see some of the potential reasons as to why we might lose hope. Um, you'll notice in this first one here, the grief over a loss. You know, we lose somebody we love, a, a spouse, a sibling, a friend, a child. Um, it, it's something that could really just knock us down without even realizing it, and that could cause us to lose hope. Regret over the past. How many of us have regrets over decisions we've made in the past by a show of hands, Okay. Don't lie, you'll regret that, okay? All right, you want to raise your hand. I think everybody has some regrets, um, even if they're not willing to raise their hand, but we regret things, mistakes that we've made, and that could cause us to, to maybe lose hope sometimes. Unanswered prayer, we're praying for this one, praying for that, praying for this to happen, it doesn't happen, and, and maybe again, uh, God's not saying no, he's just saying wait, but still, there could be some hopelessness that's attached to that if we're willing to be honest with ourselves. Uh, feeling stuck with no way out, like I don't see light at the end of the tunnel. I don't see when relief is going to happen. Uh, you know, that could make us feel hopeless. I'm praying, I'm, I'm reading, I'm doing all these things. I don't see a way out and that could make us feel hopeless. Um, you don't need to be, you know, claustrophobic. You could, you could be in a situation literally, uh, mentally that makes you feel claustrophobic. Financial struggles that keep getting worse. It doesn't seem like you can make any progress. You have more month than check. Family estrangement. Um, for whatever reason, there's uh, been problems in the family and you're separated from people and want, you, you might want to make peace. The other person wants to make war. Uh, that seems to be par for the course for many people. People drama. There's just some people, they really just should have went into soap opera acting, right? They just, they just love drama, okay? And you might have that in your life. People drama, that could feel hopeless. Like, when is this person going to wake up and realize what God has? Um, and then this is more recent uh, this year, but of course, COVID-19 concerns. Um, is there a second wave? What about this? And what about that? And this is called, that produces a whole lot of stress um, and anxiety just by mentioning and talking about those things. Civil unrest, particularly since the spring you know, New York's shootings have doubled uh, from this time from last year. And so certainly locally, we feel the, the squeeze of that. Uh, world and political news, that can make us feel hopeless at times. Plans that don't work out. You know, maybe you thought you would have been here by now, or this would have happened, or you would have uh, progressed over here. And I know that that can make us feel hopeless. I always throw out that encouragement that you, you may not be where you want to be, but by God's grace, you're not where you used to be either. So you always want to keep that in mind, but still we could feel hopeless in those situations. Like, why hasn't this happened yet? Uh, wh why hasn't this opened up yet? And so, so we can have those feelings in our life when plans don't work out and we're delayed. But here's the big one here that I want you to really focus upon. And I believe sometimes it goes unnoticed because we, we sometimes try to rely on our own strength. And it's this, being disconnected from God. Can we say that together? 
being disconnected from God. You know, when you don't have a connection with God, it could be the cause of a lot of hopelessness in your life, in your home, and in your heart. We must be really honest about that. In fact, you know, Job's friends that came to help him, Job was in a hopeless situation. Remember that? He lost everything. Um, his friends came. I don't know if you want to call them friends, but they came to offer advice. And, and you know, they, they were like that broken clock that's right twice a day. You know, like their advice wasn't totally right, but some of it was correct. And here's what it says in Job 8.11. Why don't we say this verse together from uh, the Living Translation Bible together. Those who forget God have no hope. Those who forget God have no hope. And, you know, we see that in our society today, the attempts to, the great attempts people make to try to distance God from our schools, from our children, from people, from life, um, from, from all facets of life. And we must realize that when we try to remove God out of the equation, it doesn't go well, does it? Because we lose out on that very important factor of life, hope. So you need hope. You, you could live without water for a little while, you could live without food for a little while. You could even live without your phone for a little while. Did you know that? Did you know that? You can. You could do it. You could do it. I lost my phone the other day. It was great. It was great. It was the best hour of my life, okay? Here, here's the thing. You can't live a second. Listen to this. You can't live a second without hope. You need hope. You need hope. And you need the hope that God brings. And I must tell you that uh, obviously, I, I love the Bible. I believe the Bible's inerrant. It's all God's truth. I think the enemy, the devil, doesn't want you in the Bible. But I think if there was one book he really doesn't want you in, it's the book of Revelation. And the reason why is, is that the book of Revelation explains that he finally gets it in the end, doesn't it? That he's finally destroyed, he's done with, he's toast, and God's plans unfold, and all of the prophecies of the Old Testament all that the Gospels began to build the bridge towards and the epistles alluded to was that Christ would reign supreme. All of that unfolds in the great book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation provides for believers of every age that unique hope in the prophetic, in the provisions, and in the promises of what is to come. And so it becomes a key cog in your personal walk with God and understanding the scriptures. Now, when it comes to say, when I say we're studying the book of Revelation, some of you may have already begun to try to tune me out because you're thinking, oh, the book of Revelation, isn't that about like when the world's going to end? Or isn't somebody, isn't and every, there's always like a quack talking about the world ending. Hold on, let me explain to you something here. And uh, Jen, who's here, understands this. About, we've been living at our home for about 11 years where we're at right now. And there is a house around the corner that, where the alarm goes off at least two to three times a week, okay? And, and it's one of those fancy alarms that it says things, you know, you know it, I've heard it say burglar or fire or, you know, so it'll say different things. Now, this has been going on for 11 years. And, and I remember in the beginning, actually, when I was walking the dog, we had Jackson, I'd run around the corner and I was on fire, with, but nothing was happening. And a couple of neighbors know the same thing. This guy always sets his alarm off. It's kind of crazy. And it just went off the other day, last Monday, a matter of fact. And I heard it, but I, the, the automated voice was talking. I couldn't even tell you what it was saying. The house could have been on fire, but I didn't even flinch because of all the false alarms. And I submit to you today that I think the enemy and his strategy has allowed there to be a lot of false alarms about end times to desensitize people to the hope that only Jesus Christ can bring. And so we want to unpack this first part of the book of Revelation. And I, I, I truly believe that there's going to be some things that you're going to hear that you never heard before, because just by way of what the book's about, the book's not a horror story. It's a hope story. That's what it is. It's, it's the hope of Jesus Christ. It's the hope of the provision of atonement, and it's the hope of his arrival that's coming again. And that is the hope we need. Whether you are one or all of these things on this list or other things on this list, God has an answer for your hopelessness. And so we've titled this series, as I mentioned, Reveal. And the reason why is the very word revelation means to reveal to unveil, the name of our small group series. 
to make visible. And so let's dive in here, starting in Revelation chapter 1. We'll get the context. We'll get who it's written to, who's the author. We'll get all of that good stuff here. But let's just dive in here in verse 1. It says this. Why don't we start by saying the first part of it here to Jesus Christ together. The revelation of Jesus Christ. There you go. It is the revelation. It is the unveiling, the revealing, to make visible the Lord Jesus Christ to all of us. Now, we could just go home right now. we got enough hope just reading that. But since you came out, let me just finish the rest of it, okay? Give you the fill-ins here. The, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, that word revelation means apocalypsis, and it means, again, to unveil, to reveal, to make visible. It's mentioned 21 times in the New Testament. And you, Peter and John say it. Um, when you look earlier in the beginning of the life of Christ, Simeon, who said, you know, the light has been revealed to us. It is a beautiful word. And here it's saying the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now notice this next part, which God gave to him. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. Because remember in, in Philippians chapter two, when the apostle Paul wrote through the superintendent of the Holy Spirit, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's what? Lord. He's King of Kings and he's Lord of Lords. And guess what? The book of Revelation is about exalting Christ. Oh, on the first time he came, he was very humble, born in a dirty feeding trough with animals. The Son of Man had no place to lay his head. But when he comes again, he will come in majesty and in glory, and it will be unmistakable to all, which God gave to him. Now, to show his servants, that's believers in Jesus Christ. Those are people in the past, uh, believers in the past, those who lovingly devoted themselves to God, the servants of God, by way of the Holy Spirit, by way of the teaching of the Scriptures, are privileged to hear the Word of God. And this, the things which must soon take place. Now, this is where people get a little tuzembats, okay? A little loco, a little crazy, Oh, it's happening now. It's gonna, the election, that's it. The end of the world or, or the vaccine or, or COVID-19. It's the end. And everybody gets crazy. They've been doing this for a long time. Remember Y2K? People were buying, you know, mayonnaise is bigger than they can carry. And, and the end of the world's going to happen in January 15th. And people with their predictions when the end of the world's going to happen. Nobody knows the time. Nobody knows the time. But God. But the Trinity. That's it. And so which must soon take place, what does that mean? That means that God has a calendar, he has an order. We are living in what's called the church age, which means after Christ rose from the dead, walked the earth for 40 days, then ascended to heaven, that's when the church began, when the Holy Spirit came down the day of Pentecost. The church began then, and we've been living in the last 2,000 years in what is called the church age. In this age, there has been a great expansion of the gospel, as we know, across Europe, all the way. Here. I mean, it's been truly amazing that we're talking about the gospel here on our island of Staten right now today. It's truly been amazing. Nevertheless, what will soon take place doesn't refer to tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year. What it means is, is that after God allows the rapture of the church to happen, which means when he takes his believers out of this world and the tribulation begins, everything that has taken place here in the book of Revelation will happen in what's called rapid succession. So that's what it means that it will soon take place, that as these events unfold, they'll happen very quickly. Now, the next part says, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Now, circle the word angel. It's mentioned 71 times in the book of Revelation. It's mentioned in every chapter except for chapters 4 and 13 in this book. And angels play a critical role in giving us pictures in the book of Revelation. Lots of pictures in the book of Revelation as we, we begin to unpack it. Now, who is the angel? Most likely Gabriel. Um, we know that he is on announcement duty with the birth of Christ, and we know that he plays a, a very important prophetic role in saying what's to come. Most likely Gabriel is delivering this message. And, you know, when you think about the book of Revelation, what's also very unique about it, it's the only book that's communicated by way of angelic means. No other book in the Bible is communicated this way. You have messages that are given by way of an angel, but not an entire book. 
only the book of Revelation. And then it says to his servant, John. Now, obviously, John's a very popular name um, in these times, but this is the apostle John, as you know. He's written the gospel of John and the, the three books of his epistle. He is the eldest living disciple, the only living disciple. Um, you might recall that the only disciple that was at the foot of the cross was who? John. And perhaps this was a reward of God for his faithfulness for that. You could ask him when you get to heaven. That's what I think. But nevertheless, John is tasked with writing this book. And as John gets the visitation from the angel, he has been banished to a place called the island of Patmos. You must understand the political climate of the day. The Roman Empire had a major grip, obviously, upon the world. We know that when you just, you could just study history and know that. But at this particular time, the Roman Empire and the Emperor Domitian had it out for Christianity. They saw Christianity as the number one threat to their political empire. Now, they feared John, they feared the Christians, not because they had swords and bullets and they held rallies and they were coming against the establishment, no, but because of the advancement of the gospel, the message of the gospel, that there's one true king and his name is Jesus Christ, and they feared that. And so what did he do to John, who was the ultimate representation of the Christianity faith at that time? He banished John to the island of Patmos, and it's there where John gets this from the angel, and that's how we have the book of Revelation. Now, verse 2, and we'll arrive at an application, it says, who bore witness? So John is the one who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So John is now the, again, the elder statesman of our Christian faith. Other documents outside of the Bible label him as such. And John is bearing witness to the very gospel that we hold in our hands, the book of Revelation here. And he is communicating this message. And the context is, is that not only John is facing persecution, but every living Christian right now at this time in AD 90 is experiencing intense persecution by way of Domitian. And this book was written to encourage people who are living in hopeless times not to give up and to have hope. Sounds like something we could use maybe. And he brings up the message here that the testimony of Jesus Christ, all the things that are soon to take place. And what he's talking about is God's message. And I think something emerges for you and I, a practical point for you and I to listen to and to do. If you want to stay in hope, write this first principle down. Avoid drifting from God. Can you say that with me? Avoid drifting from God. Some people drift away from God. It just doesn't happen overnight. And I would throw on that God's message, God's mercy, God's hope, the scriptures, church, all these things you wanted. You could just, I left a little space there. I was going to put a God's message, but there might be other things you might need to put. But avoid drifting. You don't want to drift. You don't want to drift from God. You know, drifting by definition, I, I wrote this down, is a gradual shift in position, an aimless course to become carried away with no guidance or control. And sometimes that happens in this life because of those reasons. You don't need to necessarily do something wrong. It could just be that life's been unfair to you. And all of a sudden you start drifting and you go through a situation like, or you've maybe made bad decisions or a little bit of both. And maybe that's the case for all of us. But whatever the fact is, is that the truth of the matter is that you want to avoid drifting from God because God is your source of hope. And the people in the time of John and every person afterwards would experience situations that would be hopeless. And they need to be reminded that without God, there is no hope. And thus, you don't want to drift from God. And the Bible says this over and over again. And not even just, you know, referring to it, it directly says it. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Why don't we say um, this verse together? So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away. You don't want to drift away from God. You don't want to drift away from church. You don't want to drift away from his word. You don't want to drift away from prayer. You don't want to drift away from integrity. You don't want to drift away from mercy. You don't want to do that. The enemy wants you to do that. You know what the enemy wants you to do? He wants to isolate you. Divide and conquer. That's always been his strategy. Yeah, maybe today you kind of felt like that, but hopefully God is working on your heart 
And he doesn't want you to drift away. God isn't willing for anybody to drift away. He wants all of us to be close. He wants all of us to be anchored in because he's the real anchor of our life. His word is the real anchor of our life. Look what it says in Hebrews 6.19. Why don't we say this verse together as, as well? We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Now, I asked somebody to make me an anchor here. They're very creative, okay? They painted this. this. This is made out of duct tape right here, okay? All right? Wait, wait till you see the things we got planned coming up. You're going to like it, okay? But here, here's the anchor right here, okay? And, and truly, this symbolizes the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It symbolizes our faith in Christ. It symbolizes all the things that God has left for you and I, his holy word, prayer, church, all these things that we want to be connected to. You know, what good is the anchor if you're not connected to it? You know, and obviously one of the primary purposes for an anchor is that you don't drift. The boat doesn't drift. See, a lot of times we can blame God when we drift, but God hasn't moved. We have moved because we don't have the anchor. And the anchor is Jesus Christ. And John makes that very clear. God's Holy Spirit makes that clear. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is to reveal, and, and in some cases to re, to re reveal that the core of the gospel truth, which we'll see in just a moment, that we need to be reminded that we should never lose sight of the fact that Christ died for our sins. He rose from the dead. And now what will be revealed even more is that he is coming again. And those two truths, you must know, sustain the early church and they should sustain believers. Today. See, the problem with Christianity today is We've taken the exclamation point after what I just said, and now we've put a comma on it. It's, it's okay, it's the, the death and resurrection of Christ and, and the second coming, comma, and I need, you know, I need to be entertained. I need, a, I, I need to laugh. I, I, I need lights, camera, action. I need all these things to draw me closer to God. Listen, all those things could be a conduit, but at the end of the day, our anchor is Jesus Christ. We must realize that. Well, I need everything to go my way. That's my anchor. When everything's going my way, that's when I'm straight. That's when I'm right. Well, guess what? That don't happen for anybody. Nobody has perfect circumstances. So all those things, they're not necessarily bad, but they're not the right anchor. We must realize that. Okay? You know, I thought, wait a minute. I thought if I follow God, if I go to church, if I serve, if I pray, I thought everything's going to start working out for me, right? Isn't that in Proverbs somewhere? Well, not in this Proverbs. You can make the argument that the closer you walk with God, maybe the more temptations you'll have because the enemy don't want you there. Nevertheless, you got to have the right anchor. And we got to help each other because sometimes we get a little loopy and we forget the anchor. We understand that. But the anchor is Jesus Christ. The anchor is his word. And we do not want to drift away because we'll get gonged just like I gonged the table here, okay? You don't want to drift away. The great pastor and author Charles Stanley once said, when we lack direction, we don't simply stagnate. We continue to move, usually in an unhealthy direction. You know what? You don't, you know, what happens when you start to drift? Well, just look, at some, look up some stories, unless the Coast Guard and Navy find you. What comes after drifting into the Pacific? Capsizing and drowning. So God wants you to get it at drifting, okay? He doesn't want you to get to the drowning stage. So in order to avoid drifting, depend on God, okay? Look at all those Ds there, okay? Just depend on God. Avoid the drifting that way. Anchor to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is his heart for you and I. Now, as you flip over your notes, let's look at verse 3 here in the opening text here of Revelation. Look what it says now. I love this next part. In fact, why don't we say this verse together? Because it, it kind of tells us to do that, okay? Together. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, this is beautiful right here. You know, in other words, you're going to be blessed when you read the book of Revelation. I got to tell you right now, you know, we're doing it in a small group. We're doing it here. I felt, I felt blessed all week. I got to tell you that. I'm, and I'm not talking about yachts and, and money, all those things. That, that's how people, no, I'm talking about spiritual blessings. 
Now, will God provide for you? Yes, along the way, wonderful. According, he'll, he'll provide for us according to his riches, you know, for our needs. We understand that. But spiritual blessings. Blessed, one of seven blessed statements. Beautiful, seven blessed statements. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And so I believe we're going to be blessed just, you're going to be blessed by just reading this today, by the way, and continuing to read it. I encourage you to read through the book of Revelation from now um, and read it maybe a couple times for those of you who could read fast over now over the next couple weeks. But blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear. So in other words, not only am I to, to read it, I'm to hear it. Now, when you hear something, what does that mean? I'm listening. It's not enough just to read. I'm going to listen to what God is communicating in his word. I'm not going to be prideful. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to have an open heart to what God is saying. What is God saying to me? What is God trying to encourage me with? What was God encouraging them with? And obviously, being connected to church and the small groups will help you do that. But blessed are those who hear. And then who keep it? Now, that's what Jesus said, right, in Matthew chapter 7. Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, I will liken him to a wise builder. You know, the, the rains and the storms came and it beat against the house, but that house did not fall. Why? Because it was built on the rock. And so we want to be a people who are putting it into practice. Then this last part, for the time is near. And you might be saying, for the time is near. Again, this is where people just go crazy with the, the end of the world is going to happen. You know, I know there's this one guy, and he's made a lot of money on hoodwinking people. He has been wrong over 10 times when the end of the world is going to happen. I don't know. Maybe people should stop listening to him after the first time, okay? All right? You know, maybe I got a little street smart, but I'm just saying that, okay? Because here's the thing with being a prophet. You got to be right a thousand percent. You can't be wrong one time. So he's incorrect. He needs to hang it up and retire and maybe send back the checks he's stolen from people over the years and anybody else who tries to do that. But we must realize and interpret the scriptures correctly. And sometimes it helps to understand the language that it's written in. Circle the word time in your notes. The word time, there's different words for time in the Greek language. There's chronos, which is the popular one, which refers to the clock chronological, like one, two, three, four, as we know it on our time scale. That's not the word for time here. It's kairos in, with the K in the Greek language, and it refers to seasons. And so what it's being said here is, is that the seasons are near. In other words, that again, they'll happen in rapid succession, that they're seasons, they're epics. That's what's going to, when it happens, it will happen in seasons. Not that it's happening tomorrow or next week. And so nobody needs to be scared about the tribulation. You're not living in the tribulation. And I will make very clear to you, um, this is our church belief. And as I interpret the scriptures, I, I, I see this in there very clearly. I believe we're living in the church age. I believe the next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And what that means is, is that God takes believers out of this world and into heaven, not by way of death but by just taking them up out of there. That sounds, uh, that's, oh well, my goodness, I can't believe that. Hey, you know what? I'll take that. As I've told you before, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather go, you know, by way of the upkeeper than the underkeeper, the undertaker, okay? I don't know about you. I'd rather go by, you know, by the uptaker than the, than the undertaker, okay? So now you don't need to fear that. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're out of here, you're in heaven. Now, is that going to happen in our lifetime? I have no idea. I have no idea. What I do know is that we're closer today than we were yesterday. I can tell you that. Okay, I'm, I'm a scholar. I can tell you that. We're the, but this is what I will tell you. The hope of that is, should be an encouragement to you and I to live our life in a certain way, to be devoted to God, and also not to give up hope. Now, what happens if we die before the rapture? Do we get to go to heaven or do we go to purgatory? Oh, heaven's guaranteed. You need to understand that. And there is no such thing as purgatory. And as I've told you before, Thank God, because if you got to wait for people in your family to pray you into heaven, people forget to call you when you're alive. <laughs> After they divvy up the money and the lamp and the pictures and, the, and this collection and that collection and the shirt and the blouse and the belt and everything else, they're going to forget they're gonna forget to pray for you. Let's be honest. Okay, now some of you, 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 you and I'm, I'm joking around, some of you never forget your parents. I understand that. But I'm just saying, as a whole, though, there's no such thing as purgatory and the lie that people got to pray to cross you over the finish line is ridiculous. First of all, the price has been paid in full by Jesus Christ on the cross. Heaven is a guarantee. We need to realize that. It's not a maybe so, think so, feel so. It's a no so. And, and we must understand that. So the rapture, then after the rapture is the tribulation. 
which is seven years of tribulation on the earth. There will be people who sat next to you in church, maybe, who thought you were crazy, who won't think you're crazy anymore. And they'll come to faith in Christ because they're going to know that this was true. They'll remember this sermon. This is true. You'll watch it at home. They'll remember this sermon. They'll know it's true. And they'll come to Christ. After seven years of tribulation, there will be the second coming, the thousand-year reign of Christ, uh, one final battle with the devil to destroy him, obviously, which is the great white throne judgment. It includes and then the new heavens and the new earth. I can't wait for it all to unfold. But let me tell you this, no believer should fear any of this because it's, we have a hope beyond this world that's guaranteed. Nobody should fear any of this. And so sometimes the book of Revelation is read as a bunch of fear mongering. No, it shouldn't be. Even if you're an unbeliever, nobody needs to fear you into the gospel. Get right with God for crying out loud. You're a sinner. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And one day God is going to pull the plug on things. And you don't need to come to Christ out of fear. You need to come to Christ because of what he's done on the cross for you. And there is no other way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through him. And I'm not going to say sorry if you think I'm narrow-minded. I'm doing my job. I'm sharing my conviction. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. There is only one God. And Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only name by which we could be saved. And God isn't willing for any to perish, as we looked at last week, but for all to reach repentance. And so, write this principle down then. If we're going to be blessed knowing these things, write this down. Anticipate God's blessing with obedience. Can you say that with me? Anticipate God's blessing with obedience. Now, I know you like the blessing part, but nobody likes the obedience part. Obedience, ugh. You mean, yes, that's what this verse says, that you're to read, you're to hear, and you're to do. Now, think about obedience this way. I, I wanted to share this with you. Now, you know about magnets, of course. And so I brought a magnet from home, and I brought some paper clips and stuff here. And so I want you to think of obedience as a magnet, okay? So I just put this down here, and look at all the paper clips, okay? These paper clips symbolize blessing. When you're obedient in life... When you're obedient in life, you pick up the blessings that God has for you. Obedience is the key. God is sovereign. He's holy. It's all by his grace and merit. I believe that wholeheartedly. But he's chosen for you and I to have a part. And the book of Revelation reminds us of that. And it reminds the readers who are going through persecution, you keep on keeping on. You keep obeying. You keep following regardless of what's going on. And there are blessings here for you to pick up, for you to have in your life that you are going to need. In fact, this is something that's congruent with all of Scripture. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 28.2. Why don't we say this verse together? All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. It's always been this way, and it should be, that as you are obedient, your obedience serves as a magnet for blessings. God is waiting to bless you and I. He loves you and I. Again, just think in terms of those of you who are parents. You love your children. You want to give your children more than you had and, and all that stuff. We understand that. But you know what? You especially love to give your kids as they get older when they are doing the right thing. And you'll go without so they have it. And God, in his supernatural way, is a loving parent who wants to bless his children when they're doing what's right. And so anticipate blessing, not maybe I'll be blessed. You will be blessed. God will add to you. God will lift you up. God will direct your paths. God will give you the courage and faith and peace and strength you need in this life. There is forgiveness. There is mercy. There is grace. All by his merit, by the way, but in some spiritual way. Don't even ask me how to quantify it. It's not my job or any other human being's job. It's just our job to be obedient to be obedient and anticipate blessings in the book of Revelation, wouldn't you know, is a book that teaches us to anticipate the blessings of God. And if we have trouble with that, then look back on other blessings of God. And then it's surrounded and centered in the message. Look what it says in Psalm 130, verse 5. Let's say this verse together. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word... I hope. That's, look, the connection with hope and his word. That unlocks blessing for you and I. But maybe right now you're repelling blessing. 
Has anybody ever used bug repellent before? Okay. I brought some bug repellent here. Okay. Now, some of you, your cologne smells like bug repellent. You got to get new cologne, by the way. Okay. Maybe that's why things aren't working out for you. Okay. But, but here it is. Look, bug repellent is supposed to keep the bugs actually cold off. And when we walk in disobedience, we're spraying blessing repellent all over us. God's not going to bless. We're repelling what he wants to do when we're doing things our way. Now, again, things might be going great for you in terms of what people deem as great. See, again, and that's why I am so against the prosperity gospel garbage, because what it does is, is it teaches people to have a false hope that we equate God's bless, God's real blessing with getting things. No, we must focus on the real gospel, which is what God has already given, which is his son, Jesus Christ. That's the right focus. Now, will God move in your way and provide? Of course he will. And you need to be thankful for whatever God has given to you and use it for his glory. Moving forward, we don't want to be the type of people that are living in such a way that we are repelling the blessings of God. We want to be the type of person that is receiving the blessings of God by being a magnet for it. And so just think about your life right now. Am I repelling God's blessing or am I a magnet for God's blessing? And that's just for you and God to talk about. Am I making decisions in my life right now where I'm repelling God's blessing or am I making decisions that I'm a magnet for God's blessing? I submit to you today that as Jesus Christ was given this revelation to what we're gonna, who we're going to find out in just a moment, these believers in the seven churches, he was reminding them of how to have the blessing of God and how to keep the favor of God in their life. And you want the favor of God in your life. You want God to open doors. Now, you don't have to brag. Now, some people brag about it. Guess what? That, no, no, that's it. That don't work when you do that. Because our, our boast is not to be in ourselves. Our boast is to be in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You get people that brag about things like that. That's kind of dangerous grounds. I'm almost waiting for God to pull the rug out on them, okay? What we must realize is we want to be humble and anticipate God's blessings. Now, let's button up these opening verses here for our first message. Look what it says now in verse 4 of Revelation 1. John to the seven churches. So um, we mentioned John earlier as the author. We identified him. Here's the recipients, the seven churches of Revelation. Now, some of you have, a couple of you have written in an Acts where there are only seven churches at the time, and why these seven churches, they're found and listed in verse 11, why these churches, which are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergama, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, the seven churches of Asia Minor which is modern-day Turkey. Why those seven? Were they the only seven? Uh, were they the only ones worth? No, there were other churches, but these particular churches were in a region that obviously was a, was a, a major gateway, if you will, to the rest of um, the area at that time. But even more important than that, theologically speaking, they serve at, they're literal churches, but they serve as examples for churches throughout history to follow. And so over the next several weeks together, after today, we're going to study each of those churches individually and see exactly what Jesus was saying to them and how we could apply it to us right now. Because all of those churches were facing intense persecution and they needed to be reminded to be hopeful in their time of hopelessness. And Jesus had a message for each of them. Some things they had to fix and clean up and some things that were going real well. Now, only two of the churches were doing great and had nothing that was said against them that needed to be fi fixed. But all seven of them received a direct letter from the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what it is. It says this, grace and peace to him from him who is and who was and who is to come, referring to Jesus Christ, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. They might be going, seven spirits? Wait a minute, I thought there was one Holy Spirit. Now we got seven plus this one's eight. No, no, this is referring to the Holy Spirit, singular in the Greek language here in the grammar, and seven spirits refers to the seven characteristics, the seven functions of the Holy Spirit as listed in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Zechariah. And so we see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all together in all of this, Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Now, you might want to underline that phrase because if there's a firstborn from the dead, guess what? 
there's going to be more who raise from the dead. You and I, those who believe in Jesus Christ. He's the firstborn of the dead. Guess what? When you die, it's not the end of you if your faith is in Christ. This is a reminder of that, that not only are you forgiven in this life, that you are promised a resurrection. He's the firstborn from the dead, the first fruits here. And it says this, and he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. I bet you Domitian didn't like that one. Next one, to him who loves us and who has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests of his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now put your finger there. This is a reminder of the gospel. This is a reminder of the atoning sacrifice of Christ, the provision that was given to us on the cross, that we've, we're being reminded here that we need to do something with this message. We need to attach ourselves to this message if we're going to understand the next part, because here's the next part, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And it's a reminder that, again, Christ died, Christ rose from the dead, Christ is coming again. Now, when you think about Christ coming again, I think about it in two parts. I think the rapture is half of that, of Christ coming back for his church. That's one part of the second coming. The second coming is completed after the tribulation is over, and Christ comes back with all of his people to destroy evil once and for all to have the battle of Armageddon. And that would unfold the second coming of Christ. Again, nothing for anybody to fear if your trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ today. And I, I implore you to do so. So what does that mean for you and I? You're going to want to write this last principle down. Accept God's provisions and promises to overcome adversity. Can we say that together? Accept God's provisions and promises to overcome adversity. You know, it says very clearly in Revelation 12, they overcame everything basically by the blood of the lamb. We overcome adversity the same way we've overcome sin and death, and that is by Jesus Christ. It will be the same way that there's going to be so many people that come to Christ in the tribulation and they're going to overcome whatever evil the enemy tries to throw, the mark of the beast and all this other stuff. They're going to overcome it all, even if their life is required of them because of Jesus Christ. And that same thing is true for you and I in whatever you're facing right now. You know, whatever is on this list and you want to add to whatever your hopelessness is, you need to know that as you trust in the provisions and the promises of God, you can overcome it too. That's why the devil don't want you to know this book. He doesn't want you to know the compass that Revelation provides for you when you're lost at sea and you've drifted away. He doesn't want you to have the compass of the holy word of God and the book of Revelation. I want you to have it. To put that into perspective for you and why you need to use the book of Revelation as your compass, I heard this story about a, a seaman who kept getting lost at sea. And his fellow sea buddies bought him a compass. And they said, listen, this is how you use it and this is how you get back if you drift off again because he had a habit of doing that and getting lost. Well, it happened again. And they, they always rescued him. They got the May Day call. They went out again. They, they went to get him and they rescued him. And they go, what's going on? We gave you a compass. And he said, why didn't you use it? He goes, well, I did use it. It was pointing me to go southeast, but I wanted to go north. So I kept forcing it to go north. And that's why it didn't work. Well, exactly that's why it didn't work. See, that's what people do with the Bible. You know, I want to force God to do my will. No, not by my will, but by his be done. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, not, not my revelation. So I could try to force the Bible to accommodate whatever lifestyle I want to live, whatever positions I want to have all day long. That's your choice, and I'm not going to fight with anybody about that. That's your choice, but don't make it right. Don't make it right if I do it. Don't make it right if anybody does it. The compass of God's Word will point you in the right direction, and the book of Revelation will do that as well. And so, in fact, as you see, I'm holding this up. You're going, is that the entire Bible? How small is it? It's not. This is just the book of Revelation and I, I have, this is my personal journal of the book of Revelation, as you can see all my notes for it. And I could tell you, studying through the entire book of Revelation again and compiling these notes, I could tell you without a shadow of a doubt that these are the best provisions and promises going. Do you know that? That these are the, that you're not going to get anything better than this, by the way. 
You're not going to, oh man, if I give my life to the Lord, or if I, if I choose to be a committed believer, if I choose to accept this into my life, I'm going to, no, you're not going to miss out. This is the best compass for your life by far. It's the best provisions, the best promises you need. This is the hope that God has chosen to reveal to you and I. Now, before we get to this, this closing verse right here, I want to tell you that God knows exactly what you need. And this revelation is just that. It's God saying, I know exactly what you need. You need this hope. And, you know, I heard the story about this preacher who was ministering to this banker, this very well-to-do banker, and they developed a relationship. And the banker liked the preacher, but he thought the preacher was a little crazy for his beliefs, though, and eccentric. And he, and he just said, you know what? We're friends. You have your beliefs. I have mine. Leave me alone uh, with that stuff. Let's talk about anything else but that. And uh, the preacher, though, lovingly kept praying for this guy. Well, he told his friend, the preacher, that I'm going away. I have basically kind of a checks and balances meeting away a couple of days of conference. Um, and I'll see you when I get back. We'll make plans when I get back. Fine. Um, but while the man was there, his hopelessness really started to set in. He had all the money you can have. He had a position. He had the toys that you can have that money brings. But guess what he had? No hope. And so... He sat down at his desk in his ritzy hotel and he began to write the preacher a letter. But he got embarrassed as he started to list the things he was doing, the life he was living. And he crumpled it up and he threw it out. Now, while he was writing, apparently, the preacher had a prompting on his heart not to pray anymore, but to go to the man and to once again share the news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so he, he bought a ticket and he went to the place, he went to the hotel, and he went to the front desk, found out where he was. Preachers can be convincing, because you know, they're not supposed to tell you what room somebody's in, but we have a way, we have a way. We know a guy, a great guy, okay? We know God, okay? And so he finds out the room, he knocks on the door, and the man said, I can't believe you're here. He goes, I was gonna mail a letter, but I threw it in the mail. He goes, no, I got the letter, but it didn't come by way of the post office, it came by way of heaven. And he shared the gospel with him, and the man put his faith in Christ that day, the hope of God. You know, nothing's going to stop the message. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. You know, what we see in the book of Revelation, why the enemy doesn't want you to read it, is that it's the ultimate fulfillment of prophecy. It was an encouragement to the people of this day. You'll hear me say this repeatedly. Out of the 404 verses, 278 of them refer or allude to the Old Testament. It was written in such a way that would shield the believers of that day in that if the Roman Empire intercepted this word, it would seem like a bunch of hogwash to them. That's why there's codes and metaphors in this book that a true believer would understand in that day as it referred to the Old Testament, thus concealing the message that the people would be able to receive it, so much so that we're reading it here today. It was a message of hope that's been preserved for you and I. And so I close with this note. The book of Revelation is nothing for you to fear. Whatever you're going through in your life, oh, it might, it might concern you. It might be difficult. It might give you initial fear. But remember the words of Jesus Christ. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. What's he talking about? Heaven. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. And lo, I go to prepare a place for you. That's John 14, by the way. What we must understand is fear is going to come, but you don't got to stay stuck in it because you know how it's going to work out and you know who is going to work it out, and that is God Almighty. The book of Revelation reveals and unveils the hope of heaven for you and I. And I got to tell you, I want you to know this for two reasons. The first, first reason is I don't want to get to heaven and they say, you didn't tell them about the book of Revelation in 2020. I don't want to get bad marks, okay? I don't want to get in trouble because I'm kind of accountable for you, so I don't want to get in trouble, okay? But more seriously, because I want everybody here to know without a shadow of a doubt that they're living in the promises and in the hope of Almighty God. That's why. I want you to know that. I want you to believe that no matter what it is that you're going through in this life. You could get caught up. There's a lot of winds of bad theology that blow out there today. And even if, as I say this, your pride is fighting what I'm saying and you're feeling a little tension, well, that's not me because I'm not, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'll be the first one to tell you. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart to say, stop drifting, start anticipate blessings with obedience and accept the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross 
and start looking for the second coming of Christ to come. That is what God wants for you and I. And as you look at all these things that are happening right now, God doesn't need those things to happen for the rapture to happen. Rapture could happen today. Rapture could happen before the next service, all right? It'd be nice if we got the next one in. We've already got a couple in already, you know, under our belt. Let's get the next one in at six. And maybe, maybe like eight o'clock tonight, okay? We'll be fine, all right? Maybe, maybe, maybe eight, nine o'clock, all right? You know, it can happen tonight, all right? And, if, and listen, if it happens tonight, well, you know, maybe, I guess we'll have church in heaven next week, okay? Well, I don't know how it's going to work, but we'll, 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 we'll work out fine. Don't worry, we'll work out better than ever, okay? Now, here's the thing. Regardless of how things are going to work out in your life, maybe a problem that you're going to go home to, another situation, you have nothing to fear. And I close with this verse, Luke 21, 28. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Redemption is drawing near. The completion of your redemption is heaven drawing near. I pray you know that. I pray you believe that. And I pray that you're trusting in the revealed hope of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, say amen. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. The cross, the empty tomb, and the promise of his return. I pray for those specifically that are here today that are living in hopelessness right now, oh God. Maybe something in the family, something uh, medical, something financial, something else, oh God. Uh, Maybe an unanswered prayer, whatever it is, disappointment. God, I pray that you would just lift them up, oh God. I pray, God, that the same hope that we have concerning our forgiveness, concerning our eternal life and your second coming would be the substance of hope that you breathe into our friends today. And for all of us, oh God, help us to remain with a humble expectation and anticipation of the blessings to come. We thank you for the book of Revelation. We thank you for these seven churches that we'll learn about over the next couple of weeks. And we, most importantly, oh God, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the promise of his return. And we say, even so, Lord, even so. We sow these prayers in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen.